What's up guys, it's Ed from TechSource and welcome to the build guide of Budtron, the $350 gaming PC for the month of February. If you missed the gaming benchmarks video, you can find a link to it in the description section down below. If you want to build the best possible gaming PC for only $350, then you came to the right place. I'll be showing you step-by-step -step instructions on building the PC, installing Windows, downloading the drivers and even overclocking the CPU. All the parts used in this build will be linked down below as well as optional parts that include an SSD, a CPU cooler and upgraded graphics cards if you want something with a little more power. All you need to build this PC is a screwdriver. Now if you're standing on carpet just make sure to touch the PC case every now and then to ground yourself so that you don't build up static and end up damaging the components. You can also buy anti-static wrist straps which you can find linked down below but it's not needed. Step 1 is to lay your PC case down and remove the motherboard from its box. Then take your CPU with the pins facing downwards and match the triangle on the socket to the gold triangle on your CPU. Once you figured out which direction is correct, gently place the CPU down and do not apply any force and especially do not touch the surface. If you do, you will need to wipe off your fingerprint. Make sure to use 75% or greater isopropyl and a tissue or lint free cloth like a coffee filter. If you do use tissue or toilet paper, just make sure to blow off the remaining lint from the CPU if there are any. If the CPU doesn't rest in place, you may need to wiggle it around a bit for it to fall in place. But I mentioned before, do not apply pressure since the pins are very fragile. After that, lower the lever and lock it in place. The plastic cover should pop right off, so don't freak out. Next step is to install the RAM sticks. Release the locks off each slot that you're installing. There is one on each side. Gently lower the RAM sticks evenly and apply firm pressure on both sides at the same time in order to snap them in place. Repeat the same process for all the RAM sticks. If you install it correctly, the locks should be fully seated inside of the RAM. Now it's time to install the CPU cooler. Depending on what cooler you are installing, make sure to follow the instructions listed on the manual. If you decided to pick up the optional EVO 212 cooler that I linked below, then you need to watch my build guide for the Xeon PC since I go over the installation process there. You guys can find the link to the video down below. If you're installing the stock cooler like in this video, then just follow these steps. First, position the cooler in the orientation you want. And what I usually do is I make sure to have the least cable slack as possible for a cleaner wiring job. I was actually running on 4 hours of sleep when I built this PC so I didn't realize that the CPU fan header was actually near the top of the motherboard. So instead of connecting the cable to the chassis fan which is labeled CHA fan, you need to hook it up to the CPU fan instead labeled CPU fan. You can find that right above the RAM sticks. Anyway, so installing the stock cooler is easy. You don't need thermal paste since it already comes pre-applied with some. You will need to match the four holes on the motherboard with the four pins on the cooler. So gently lower the CPU cooler down until it comes in contact with the motherboard, then simply press down on the four tabs to snap it in place. You can look at the back of the motherboard to double check that the cooler has been fully seated by looking at the four pins sticking out. Once the cooler is fully seated, connect the cable running from it to the CPU fan header on the motherboard, which I stated before should be on the top of the motherboard near the RAM sticks. You are now ready to install the IO shield and the standoffs in the case. Some IO shields come with these annoying pins that stick out and what I usually do is remove the big ones since they interfere with the installation, but you can also fold them away as well. A good way to determine if the IO shield won't interfere with the motherboard is to place it on the motherboard itself and see if there are any pins that are in the way. If they are, just simply fold them and remove them. Once you are ready, insert the IO shield in the back of the case with the three circle cutouts located near the bottom. Make sure to apply some pressure on all four of the corners to snap it in place. Now let's install the standoffs. You will need six of these gold screws that came with the case and you need to install them in these exact locations. Once they are nicely tightened, go ahead and gently lower the motherboard in while avoiding bumping it into the case and trying to match the cutouts of the IO shield with the motherboard ports. You will then need six of these silver screws with the round head and you can begin screwing in the motherboard. As always, I recommend a crisscross pattern while tightening the screws and please don't over tighten them. Only tighten them to a point where it's comfortable. You can do this by using the screwdriver with your fingers and not your entire hand, if that makes any sense. Next up, we are going to install the hard drive. Make sure the exposed area is facing downwards with the connection ports facing outwards. Slide the hard drive in any one of the racks and make sure to line the holes with the tray. Then you will need to screw it in using these two silver screws. 
If you're installing an SSD instead, the process is the same. Next up, it's time to install the power supply. So lay down your case and insert the power supply with the fan facing downwards towards the cutout located at the top of your case. You will need four of these to screw in the power supply. You can use your other hand to push the PSU against the case in order to align the holes if you want to. Now let's connect the hard drive to the motherboard. Grab the black and white SATA cable that came with your motherboard and connect one end of it to the back of the hard drive and connect the other end to either of the yellow SATA ports on the motherboard that's located near the bottom. Now let's connect the rear fan. Grab the cable from the fan and hook it up to the chassis fan header which should be right next to the battery. Next, let's go ahead and get these annoying cables out of the way. Let's start off with the HD audio cable. You don't need the AC97, so go ahead and ignore that. Locate the AAPP pins on the bottom left of the motherboard and connect the HD audio to it. Make sure that the words HD audio are facing upwards. Next up is the USB cable and this one connects to either one of the pins labeled USB which should be to the left of the yellow SATA cables. This time make sure the words USB are faced downwards. Next up are the power LED wires and these connect to the yellow pins on the motherboard right above the SATA ports. So the positive one goes in first on the top left and then the negative one goes to the right of that right next to it just like this. Next up we have the power switch and this one goes right next to the two power LEDs. It doesn't really matter which way you insert this one in. Next up is the HDD LED and this one goes right under the power LEDs with the words facing downwards. And finally the reset switch goes right next to the HDD LED and it doesn't matter which way you face this one as well. Here's a quick look at what the bottom part should look like. Again the reset switch can be facing downwards or upwards, it doesn't matter. Now let's give some power to the hard drive. So grab the SATA power cable from the power supply that looks something like this and connect it to the back of the hard drive right next to the SATA connection. Now we're going to connect the 24 pin motherboard cable and it looks something like this. Locate the 24 pin socket on the motherboard which is located to the right side of the RAM sticks and hook them up. Make sure the clip from the 24 pin cable is fully seated and that there are no gaps. The next cable we are going to connect is for the front fan. So grab the female Molex connector from the front case fan and grab a male Molex connector from the power supply and connect the two together. The last cable we are connecting is for the CPU. Grab the cable that has two 4 pin connectors labeled CPU and connect only one of them to the socket on the motherboard located right above the CPU fan. Make sure you hear it snap in place. So we are done with connecting all the cables. The final piece to this build is the graphics card but before we can install it we need to remove the two PCIe plates in the back. Just use your screwdriver or flathead and push them out. Then you can grab it from the other end and pull them off. You may need to wiggle it a bit for them to get loose first. Before you insert your graphics card in there, make sure to peel off any stickers that are still on it. Face the GPU so that the fan is facing downwards and hook it up to the very first PCI slot on the motherboard for optimal performance. While holding up the GPU, use one of the same screws that you use for the power supply and tighten it up. So you're basically done assembling your PC. If you did everything correctly, your PC should look something like this. Basically if Fender were to vomit in your case. Take this time to do some cable management, velcro straps and zip ties are great. What I did was wrap everything together and store all the cables on the top right. Also make sure all the cables are connected and fully seated to avoid boot up problems. Now we are ready to install a fresh copy of Windows 8.1 and you guys can upgrade to Windows 10 for free later on. If you're putting in your old SSD or hard drive that already has Windows on it, then you don't need this step. For everyone else, this is what you do. Grab a flash drive with at least 8 gigabytes of space and plug it into a different computer. Visit the Microsoft website and download the installation media. I did leave a link to it down below. Click on the create media button so it downloads it on your PC. Go ahead and install and run the program. Make sure to select the language, edition and architecture of your PC. Everything should match with my screen unless you're using a different language and Windows edition. Click next and select the USB flash drive option and click next again to choose your USB drive that you have connected to your PC. Once you click on next for a final time, a message will appear stating that the files will be deleted on the USB drive, so make sure that you don't have anything important on them. Click on OK to proceed. This should take some time to download depending on your internet speed, but once it's done, it will state that your USB drive is ready. 
you will need a legit Windows CD key to continue. If you don't want to pay full price for them, you can find them for around 25 bucks on the Reddit CD Key Swapper, which is where I get all my CD keys from. I'll go ahead and drop a link to this page in the description section if anyone is interested. But wherever you guys get your CD key from, make sure it's for Windows 8.1 Pro Edition and not the Standard Edition. Once you get your CD key, we are ready to install Windows. So go ahead and insert the USB drive into the PC you just built and boot it up. It should automatically detect the USB drive and take you straight to the activation screen. If it doesn't, restart the PC and hit the F8 key for the boot menu and select the USB flash drive option. If the USB drive doesn't come up then you connected the USB cables incorrectly on the motherboard, make sure to go back and watch that part again. Once you get to the activation window, go ahead and type in the CD key and select next. Accept the terms and conditions and then once you get to the screen, select the custom option and select the drive you want to install Windows on. If you have only one like me, then select the primary partition, which is usually labeled number 2, and then go ahead and hit next. Let Windows do its thing and install. Usually when it's complete, it will tell you to remove the USB drive and click on OK to restart the PC, but in my case it didn't, so if you see the PC restarting on its own, quickly remove the USB drive so it doesn't boot from it again. Windows will continue to install the files and set everything up for you. Once you get to the personalized screen, follow the instructions and fill out all of the boxes until you reach the home screen. Now it's time to install the drivers. Since the PC doesn't come with a built-in Wi-Fi adapter, you can buy one of these things that costs around $10 and plug it into a USB port and voila, you have Wi-Fi. I'll drop a link to it down below if anyone is interested, but if you're going to connect your PC via Ethernet cable, then you don't need it. So first we're going to install the motherboard drivers, so go to the ASUS website and search for your motherboard. I left a link to it down below so it's easier for you guys to find it. Once you're at the screen, select the support tab, then navigate to drivers and tools. Once you're over here, you have to select your Windows operating system, which should be 8.1, and then you need to download the following. The chipset software, Realtek audio drivers, Realtek LAN drivers, and as an optional download that I recommend, the ASUS AI Suite 3 program. Once you downloaded those four files, make sure to extract them and install them on your PC. Then you are ready to install the graphics card driver. Since we have a GTX card, visit the GeForce website. Once again, I'll leave a link to it down below. Once you are here, download the automatic driver updates since it will always detect your GPU and keep your drivers updated. Once it's downloaded and installed on your PC, you are done with all of the drivers. Finally, it's time to do the overclocking. If you don't want to overclock your CPU, you can skip this step and you are done. But if you want increased performance, then follow these steps. Turn on the PC or restart it and hit the delete key on the keyboard to get into the BIOS. Once you are here, click on the advanced mode tab on the bottom or just simply hit F7 and navigate to the AI tweaker tab. Once you are here, make sure that the settings on your BIOS match with everything on my screen. The CPU core ratio should be set to sync all cores and the ratio limit should be set to 43 to achieve the 4.3 GHz clock speed. Scroll down to the CPU core voltage section and set that to manual mode and then proceed to override the voltage to 1.345. Once you do that, hit F10 to save your settings and then it will reboot your PC. Once you get to the desktop screen, you can open up CPU-Z, which is a free program, and check your overclock speeds. As you can see, it's showing 4.299. Now, I did stress test the PC for 10 hours using Prime95, so these settings are stable. But please keep in mind that not all CPUs are the same, and if you experience crashes, then you need to lower your clock speed. Adding a CPU cooler that I linked below can definitely help prolong the life of your CPU and get you even higher clock speeds. So that's it for the video. If this helped you out, or if you enjoy my build guide, make sure to leave a like as it does help me out a ton and if you have any questions feel free to find me on twitter thank you guys so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video